Upcoming schedule tonight, we will do what if next month. Answer to life's most asked questions. Uh, you were talking about at some point uh, possibly having to send a talk to your youth. We have a couple of good options for that. We do have uh, the creation series of which you're going to see the first episode tonight. And I have to credit the ladies back there with saying really a, a, a great idea because our our clientele, the people who regularly attend, change over a six or seven year period. And so a lot of this preliminary material that we started with, um, three quarters of you have never seen. And so we will start going through that. I'm going to point out some of those that are there. Our today, May, and August are all out of my original creation series, although they've been updated in the past 35 years. Um, but again, in terms of what we'd like to bring to youth, you've got tons of options. We will do shortened uh, segments of what I'm doing tonight along with the rest of our creation seminar. You can pick and choose what uh, topics you'd like, and that's all on our website. Or you can go through the Answers to Life series specific for you that answers questions like, why is there death and suffering? Uh, who was Cain's wife? And all these other weird questions that youth love to ask. Um, we will go through our nation's biblical foundation with Terry Reed in June, July, the UFO conspiracy video, and in August, the introduction of creation theories. The UFO conspiracy, who's it like? This is from uh, 2003, and I forget the author, but uh, let's see what happened. From who? Um, Barry Bates? No, this is not very big. No, this is separate from CMI. This is uh, before it. Yeah. It's called uh, uh, from the Liberty Video uh, series. It comes to the same conclusions right. as CMI, but it is it is a different video. For uh, anyone who is just uh, a creation fruitcake and can't get enough of it, tomorrow night in Houston. There is a good seminar going on in Houston tomorrow night with the Greater Houston Creation Association. They've got uh, Dr. John Baumgartner and Dr. Tim Cleary, both from ICR, that are going to do a uh, creation, a in-depth creation seminar tomorrow in tonight in Houston. Um, so again, if you are just gung ho, that, that's available. Incidentally, as always, all of the stuff that I'm talking about is on our website. Um, prayer concerns do show us how to respond to the new COVID variants and how to deal with what's an endemic condition. It's not going away. Pray that our nation heals and comes together. Pray for protection for the First Amendment, our institutions, and religious freedom. And pray for Ukraine. Uh, there's some old people fighting one heck of a battle in Ukraine right now. Some Americans. So Americans. Communicate headlines, misconceptions on inerrancy, the first seen in ancient animals and man, the Nosovans and Neanderthals were both human, is the moon younger than we thought, and Genesis commentary. That's all in uh, this month's uh, Depends on what you thought. Communicate. Yeah. <laughs> I got in some data that you gave me in that in, that, in the rebuttal of that. Because what the, all they're doing in the article, what I often do, is I grab something out of a technical journal or off, yeah. the, off the internet. And these guys are saying, no, it wasn't, it wasn't 4.4 uh, billion years old, it's actually 4.25 billion years old. <laughs> and I take, yeah, I take that as a springboard, one, to use your data to show how bad those dates are, how bad the date is. And then start to talk about the whole history and, and, and where common sense should show into that part. Okay, uh, we still are on radio, have been for more than five years now. Yay! Uh, we just, oh, time flies whether you recognize it or not. Uh, we do have Life in Outer Space this past weekend, that's now on uh, podcast. What is that, microscopic or macroscopic? Uh, I'm talking about directed pants for I, I can because we talked about both topics I can't even remember and is that a recent one or is that a repeat? I can't remember. Life in outer space. It's a repeat. Uh, 
that's a repeat. We have radiometrics, age of the earth in the Bible, dinosaurs in the Bible, and a whole lot of other stuff. Uh, one of the things that will come on in uh, June is a two-part discussion we had an interview with Russ Miller. Uh, Y'all may not know Russ Miller. I didn't until I saw him on uh, Creation in the 21st Century with David Reeves two week, uh, more than two weeks ago. Uh, and he has a creation ministry that centers in Arizona. And what he does is a lot of raft trips and uh, uh, staircase tours in the Grand Canyon. And he's, been feature, and he's been featuring this type of creation approach for the last 22 years. So we'll have those discussions with Russ in, uh, in June. First Rock says nothing to do with music. Now, that one didn't want that one didn't want to go. We'll just cut that. Rock's Craft series, as you were asking me, do our do for the 18th year doing the science workshops at Feast. Yay. We got a great response to that. Uh, now with both children and adults. In March, we will do Dragons and Dinosaurs. This is always on the fourth Wednesday in, in each month at 10 a.m. at Feast. On, in April, we'll do the Age of Creation. What are we saying? 6,000 or 12,000? Well, we're, we're, we'll take anything less than 15,000. Oh. The, 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 point, the point is, it ain't 4.5 billion. Well, I don't know that. Okay. And I will tell you that this has been so successful at Feast because that uh, Rocks Cry Out series of Bruce Malone out of Search for the Truth has now stretched that out to an 18 part series that we will do part 7 through 12 next year at Feast. Uh, what does Feast stand for? Family Educators Alliance of South Texas. And if I hadn't been athletic director for them for five years, there's no way I would have been, been able to answer that question. <laughs> They're, they're the homeschool. They're the they're the primary homeschool group in Bear County. And in point of and fact, secondary, huh? Primary, secondary, primary, secondary, everything. Well, the, the truth of the matter is, they are the precursor to most of what goes on in homeschool across the U.S. Um, they set up the first homeschool conventions. Well, wow. they set up the state basketball tournament. They set up the national basketball tournament. Wow. Uh, Feast has a rich history. All right. Well, I was glad I could participate in it. But I think it's my yeah. Although I can't get there at 10 o'clock in the morning because that's money. You're, you're, you're actually doing something, yeah. Gainfully employed. <laughs> well, a little bit. <laughs> All right. Any. Uh, Questions or thoughts on any of that before I get in a nice program? This is a program that was uh, 35 years in the making. I, have, I do have to credit Dr. Bill Tierney who uh, gave me the ideas for this program and actually turned me from being a theistic evolutionist into a younger creationist 36 years ago when I saw a presentation by Dr. Tierney, a biology professor at Air Force Academy uh, in Granby, Colorado, 36 years ago. Question. If God wrote the Bible, what kind of evidence would he leave? Mm -hmm. I, I hope so. <laughs> if it's the original, we would expect most original stories from other cultures to reflect and borrow elements from the original Genesis account. We would expect to see that. We're going to investigate where we find that. Two, historical. Do geology and history support the Bible? Yes, indeed. Well, we often hear that they, well, no, they disproved the Bible this way. We're going to talk about that. Does God write history in advance? Oh, yeah. Well, what does the Bible call it? Prophecy. prophecy. We're going to find out that there are, there are 2,500 prophecies in the Bible, approximately. And we're going to explore how many of those have been fulfilled so far. He would protect his word. You're going to find out that he's done that rather magically over the years to protect his word. Philosophical and logical coherence. Does it all hang together? The Bible is 66 books written over approximately 1,900 years by 40 authors on three continents in three languages. 
And yet, does it all hang together as, as if one mind was writing it? We're going to examine that. And finally, is there pre-science in the Bible? Pre-science <laughs> would be science. The Bible is not a history textbook. However, if it's going to talk about the creation and what God's done, it's going to by chance or intermittently talk about science. And when it does, we would expect it to be 100% correct. And in point of fact, there are 200 places in the Bible where it talks about science thousands of years before man discovered it. My book covers more than 100 of them, but I won't hit that many tonight. If it's the original, we would expect most origin stories of other cultures to reflect and borrow elements of the original. We're going back to that first point. Now, first off, what does it say in Genesis 1? It says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. It also says God created dry light, dry land, vegetation, sun, moon, stars, birds, fish, insects, animals, and finally the first man, each re reproducing according to its kind. And we're going to find out whether we find these types of elements in creation accounts from all over the world. We examined over 300. There are 300 in the book, and there's not 300 tonight, but we're going to examine a few of them. What do we see in other cultures' origin stories? Well, in Buddhism, creation occurs repeatedly throughout time. At the beginning of each cycle, land forms in darkness on the surface of the water. Where have I heard that before? Yeah. Yeah. Right out of it. Could be right out of the Bible. There are spiritual beings who populate the universe in the previous cycle or reborn. And one of them takes the form of a man and starts the human race. We started from what? One original man. Unhappiness and misery reigns. Sadly, that's on our resume. When did sin come into the world? world? We brought it. This is today. Eventually, the universe dissolves and all living creatures return to the soul life. And then they talk about the cycle repeating. But are there elements here that could be from the Genesis account if Genesis predated the Hindu faith? The Buddhist faith, excuse me. All right? Chinese, and you may not know it, but prior to 500 BC, the Chinese were monotheistic. They only became polytheistic once uh, Buddhism and, and, and uh, Confucianism. Confucianism, the two first two were Buddhism and Confucianism. They now have Taoism, Jainism, they got every ism there is. Yeah, they got a lot of isms. But they were monotheistic to start with. In 2250 BC, Emperor's son sacrificed to Shanti. Shanti is the God. In the beginning, there was great chaos without form and dark. Again, consistent with the Bible. The five elements or planets had not begun to revolve nor the sun or moon shine. Again, according to the Bible, when did the sun and moon start shining? Day three. Four, excuse me, thank you. Thou, O spiritual sovereign Shanti, does divide the grosser part from the pure. What division occurred? The, water, the light from the dark, which would be the grosser from the less, or the land from the water. Thou madest heaven, thou madest earth, thou madest man. All things with, with grief producing power got their being. One, is that correct order? Hmm. Heaven, earth, man, yes, but also all things with re re reproducing power got their being could be a reference to kinds that's talked about in the Bible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, with the Chinese, I do another presentation <coughs> in which I look at about 112 of the, hot, of the ancient Chinese pictographs, mm -hmm. picture words. And in those, we find some interesting things. For example, if you put heaven and emperor together, you get Shang-Ti God. Well, that makes sense. But there's some that show that this had to come from Genesis. This had to come from a knowledge of Genesis. Spirit is one cover or roof, so hovering over, water, three persons. Why would there be three persons? Trinity. The Trinity. In 2500 BC in China? Ooh. And you don't think, well, that, that, that really can't be true, and he's a worker of magic, but that can't be true until you see the other 111 and it's so consistent. In point of fact, out of that presentation, you can understand everything from Genesis 1 
through 11 just through Chinese pictographs. They knew the, they knew the account. They knew the story. Other theories, but in Africa, in the beginning only darkness, water, and the great god Boomba. One day in pain, Boomba vomited up the sun, which dried up some of the water, and revealed land. Then he vomited up the moon, stars, and the animals and fighting men. Now, if you can get by all the vomiting, <laughs> is the order right? Yeah. Is what occurred right? Is the drying up of the, of, the, of the land and appearance of the land correct? Well, it's appearing. It appears after the sun. Understood. But it, again, the point is there are elements here. Is it, are these through time and difference going to be distorted in some way? Yep. They are. But the elements are there. The Mayans were now changing not only hemispheres and continents. In the beginning were the sea, sky, and the maker. The maker created the earth, the mountains, trees, and animals, but they could not speak. So he created humans first from the mud of the earth. According to the Bible, we were created from what? Dirt. The dust of the ground. And incidentally, this is a repeated thing we see in creation accounts all over the world. That we came from dirt, dust, mud, or clay. That's it. It's dirt. Repeatedly. Just a little bit of difference in water. Yeah. The Epic of Gilgamesh. Now, one of the interesting things about Gilgamesh is, and we'll talk about this later, is, is there are people who believe that the Bible borrowed from Gilgamesh and from the Enuma Elish. They're wrong. But they're wrong, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, Gilgamesh was an epic point for Mesopotamia. It's among the earliest surviving works of literature around 1800 BC. It parallels the story of Cain and Abel. It has nine elements in the story of Noah's Ark and the Flood. The Bible t details in more works. There are two details tests that show us that no, the Bible account came first. One is that when you start looking for elements that are from Gilgamesh as opposed to the Bible, when you look at those 300 or more accounts across the world, which one has elements from which more? The Bible. Now, that could mean the Bible was the original account, or it could just mean it was more widely distributed. There's a second details test, however, and that second details test that, that uh, paleontologists use, or archaeologists use, is that when they start looking at a text and they're trying to figure out whether it was the original or something else was the original, just like humans, always the more embellished text is the copy. That, well, that's just like my son. My son, when I took him up to, what's the lake up there near Lano? Took him up near Lano. He dipped his, his uh, rod in, caught a fish. It's about that big. We kept it, did an impression of it, and all that kind of stuff. By the time he was 18, that was Moby Dick. <laughs> okay? That's right. The size of the fish he caught and all this kind of stuff. We always embellish things at the time. Well, and, the truth, and the truth of the matter is the Genesis account is more succinct. The Gilgamesh and Anuba Elish uh, sagas are much more embellished and they show that they came from the Bible in that way. Do you think the problem is the writings of Moses were like about 1400 B.C.? The writings of Moses were 1400 B.C., but one of the things I'm going to show you is that this account, he was only an editor. The account was there from, from when we got off the boat of Noah. Okay? And it was carried forward either by other writings or by word of mouth for the next, what's 25, 1100 years. Absolutely. Uh, the Enuma Elish is a, Bible, is a Babylonian creation account. The cuneiform script was again written around 1800 BC. There were seven tablets. Why do I find that interesting? Seven days of creation. Earth was without form and empty. Ooh, that comes from what? The Bible. Both suggest order came out of this formless state. Both records tell of the creation of the moon, stars, plant life, animals, and man. In their order. That's the correct order. Incidentally, it's not the evolutionary order. According to evolution, what should come first? The stars. Well, yeah, the stars, but you also should have animals before plant life. Yes. I'd like to know what they lived yes. in. Biblical 
order. This all is out of the Enuma English. Primeval unorganized first matter is on the first tablet. The coming of light. The creation of the firmament. Appearance of dry land. Amen. Creation of the luminaries, sun, moon, and stars. Creation of man is on the sixth tablet. Why is that interesting to me? It's on the sixth day. The deity rests, and the modernists again say that this, that the Bible borrowed all this from this stuff, but again, the details tests that I show show us that that was not true. That they borrowed from the Bible, and we just talked about that. Islam, the Quran says there was creation in six days. Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, expelled from Eden, and it includes the flood. That's all, that's, that's all borrowed from the biblical account. Recurrent themes we see beginning in darkness and water. We see this across all three, or most of the 300 uh, stories that we investigated. A single God or creator. Biblical order, heavens, land, vegetation, animals, and man. Sacrifice of a God-man. Pain and suffering coming into the world. Human race comes from a first man. Spiritual beings, and the earth is destroyed in the end. Again, we see these reflective. Now, this does not prove that the Bible is God's word. But if we had not been able to find all these things, it would indicate, well, it's kind of questionable. At least we're moving forward with this. There are 270 flood legends in the world. 270 of those 330-something uh, creation accounts that we looked at have flood legends. China has one, Hawaii, Babylon, the Toltecs. Uh, I really like it in Hawaii. they got two names for Noah. They either call him No or New. And that's something weird. Is There's a lot of names for Noah because with time and distance, things got distorted. But very often the end sound is the start of his name. For example, the Delaware Indians called him Nenabush. <laughs> Starts with an N, but it's very different from Noah. One of the interesting things about these stories, if you look at the Assyrian Babylonian uh, accounts, they are almost in lockstep with the Bible. Universal destruction, animals saved, humans saved, uh, favorite family, etc. But what happens is we get further away with distance and time from the Middle East, from where the Bible, biblical accounts started. The stories become more and more distorted. Would we expect that to occur as people fanned out across the world? Yes. Especially with word of mouth communication, we certainly would. <clears throat> the poor tablet. This is 2100 BC. This is 300 years before Gilgamesh and. Uh, the Enuma uh, Elish. They're just fragments like this. The Babylonian city of the core library is where this came from. It talks about a deluge that destroys all life. God commands the building of a great ship. His family and animals are preserved. And it's in a language very akin to ancient Hebrew. And in point of fact, we had a whole video on this from the, from the uh, people patterns of evidence. Chinese symbol for boat. You put a vessel with eight people on it and you've got a boat. Now why do I think that's kind of interesting? How many people were on the ark? Eight. eight. And again, just by itself, that's kind of interesting. Me, myself, if I'm, if I'm going to draw a boat, I just draw a boat. But they put these radicals together and they do it again and again. Here's an example. Dust plus breath Two persons in an enclosure is a garden. If I'm drawing a picture for a garden, I draw a flower. But what, why is this interesting? Because it, show, it tells the story of the two people in the garden originally. Tempter, secret man, garden alive is the devil. Devil trees cover. What do they have to cover? Naked. Themselves, because they found out they were naked when they sinned. It tells the Genesis account, and this is from 4,500 years ago. There are two sets of pictographs here. Here's the Chinese pictographs, and here's from the Wall of Mullum, which I'm not even going to go over tonight. It's detailed in the book. And that's, the, that's the account of the red record from the Delaware Indians. But what these two show is a lot of crossover 
These records show that the Genesis account predates the Elish and Gilgamesh and all other accounts by more than a thousand years. It's estimated that the Wall of Mullum account, which again is in the book, which is very close to the Genesis account, is from 4,000 years ago, far before Moses wrote it down, far before Gilgamesh or Anubi Elish was written down. 4,000 BC is the flood. Four, yeah, it's flood time, yes. These broad elements and themes reflect the creation stories from cultures all over the world for thousands of years, indicating they all came from this original world. Now, I detailed 29 of the book. As I say, we investigated over 300. We picked out 29 of the book because I did not want the book to become the Encyclopedia Britannica. In fact, he was counseling me on that. Uh, and there are multiple PhDs who will verify that that's what this means, that it is God's word from God's original account. Okay, so we have some background that it was other cultures borrowing from the original. What about historical records? We're told all the time, well, we've disproved the Bible because it doesn't relate to real history. Let's check that. It is rumored that the Bible and historical accounts are sometimes in conflict, showing that the Bible is an error and thus not an error, perhaps not God's word. What's the truth of this? Sir William Ramsey, born in the 19th century, was educated in the Tubingen School of Thought at Oxford. He was the son of two atheists and an atheist himself. He believed in the higher criticism. If you don't know what the higher criticism was, it was basically the idea that we know better than the Bible. We need to divorce ourselves from Moses because man is brighter than this. That's just all junk. Late 1800s, he spent 25 years in Asia Minor trying to disprove the Book of Acts. Uh, if you're talking Asia Minor, he's basically talking the area around Turkey. <clears throat> Luke mentions 32 countries, 54 cities, 9 Mediterranean islands, and 95 people groups. 65 of these people groups are not mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament. Why was this interesting to an atheist like Ramsey? You wanted to disprove it. Yeah, here's a lot of junk to check out. There's a lot of if I can find, if, I, if he's, the Bible says these are facts, if I find they're untrue, I can disprove the Bible. I can show it's full of errors. Every reference which could be verified is found to be 100% correct. How could Luke be so accurate? He was operating within the first 100 years of Christ. But, he was, but his was not eyewitnesses he, of himself. He was not there. He had to interview other people. He had the benefit of being a medical doctor and was fairly precise. But did he have the internet or libraries like we have today? No. No, he didn't. And yet, when he writes a book, it's found to be what? 100% accurate. Man's not that good. But God says he'll preserve his word. God does say he'll preserve his word. Ramsey commented, he concluded the book could bear the most minute scrutiny as an authority for the facts of the Jinn world. That's talking about the book of Acts. Ramsey accounted, I set out to look for the truth where Greece and Asia meet and found it in Acts. When Ramsey turned his attention to Paul's letters, most of which the critics dismissed as forgeries, he concluded that all 13 New Testament letters that claimed to have been written by Paul were authentic. He was an atheist. What did the Bible do? Changed him. It turned him into a believer. And there's a lot of stories like that. What happened to Lee Strobel? What happened to Josh McDowell? There are a lot of people that set out to prove God ain't there, is wrong, and the Bible and His Word and His truth have changed them. You know that we found Jericho. It's not just a Bible story. It's a biblical account. Here are the relics of Jericho with a, with a schematic of the, of the archaeology and unearthing. Here is Jericho itself with what on the sides of the walls? Places where it was what? Fallen out. The I, Apple. I, I think Jericho is also what I talked about in Exodus really too. Was it uh, uh, remember they came out? Or what was the name? Patterns of evidence? Yes. Ebla is a Babylonian or Syri Syrian writing talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. Is Sodom and Gomorrah talked about in the Bible? Yes. Life and Ur, Abraham and others. Abraham's home city of Ur was excavated by Sir Leonard Woolley. 
These are all substantiations for the fact that the things in the Bible were real history and occurred. The Quran and Jewish writings, they verify the existence of Christ and other biblical characters. How many biblical characters can we verify from archaeological finds? 105. We're finding them all the time, including Pontius Pilate. Sodom and Gomorrah, we found it. Jordanian shore of the Dead Sea. Bab Edera, in Arabic means Sodom. That's right there. And Numera, which means Gomorrah. Found all five cities in the plain, mentioned in Genesis 14.8. All five were on a Dead Sea rift, a plate boundary. What does that tell you? All God had to do was say, have a good earthquake and a good volcanic action. Are you pointing them out on that diagram? Could you do that? I, I, would have, I would have to find them in pieces here. They were better on the previous one. With Sodom being there and Gomorrah being, excuse me, with Gomorrah being there and Sodom being there. That's quite a distance between the two of them. Yep. Because it's this whole valley that's taken out. All right, at God's command, the rift ruptured and a pyroclastic blast ensued. This whole valley, all five cities, have a burn layer across them, showing what occurred when they were all destroyed. What about the city that protected Lot for temporary rebuilding? <clears throat> that was outside of that valley. That was outside the valley. That was outside the valley. Destroyed them. Destroyed the whole area along the fall. Now, God was especially upset with Sodom. Because Sodom was sitting right on the fault line and fell into the fault. A hundred meters down. Now, one of the interesting things is people have said for years, and we're talking 17th and 18th century, the Bible's full of errors. They, the Bible talks about this guy named Nebuchadnezzar that never existed because we can't find any archaeological evidence for it. The Bible talks about a King Sargon. We found no evidence for him. Well, in Isaiah 21, Sargon... It talks about Sargon, and Sargon's palace has been recovered at Korsbad, and this is a relief from that excavation, showing that he did exist, that the Bible is not just telling the story. Nebuchadnezzar's palace and library when it was uncovered. Here's one set of writings from that library. They were real, real history. The Bible is telling a true account of what occurred. Is that language that was written, is that cuneiform? I have no idea. Cuneiform, yes. It was. May well have been. Right. In Genesis chapter 10, you have the table of nations. Now, it tells from the, from the table of nations how uh, the three sons had grandsons of Noah and how they spread out. Well, interesting thing. Mizraim was one of the grandsons, and he goes over here. His name's Mizraim. The ancient name for Egypt was Mizraim. Very close. They talk, in, in point of fact, you can find Mizraim in ancient texts of the first person to be around there. Javan. What does Javan mean in Hebrew? Greece. Because Javan was the first guy to go to the Greek, to the Greek peninsula. Cush is a real interesting one. He's down here. What do the Ethiopians call themselves to this day? Cushites. Because they recognize the first person in the area, which is their secular records confirming what the Bible tells us. Uh, Gomer, man, Gomer got around. This dude has Baltic states in which they mention Gomer as the first person there, as does Northern Europe, and there's even a mention of him almost at the British Isles. Gomer got around a lot of places, but he was a beach boy, huh? He was a beach boy, but there, there, was, there, was, there was a lot of text that shows that he was the first in the area, which is part of the Babel diffusion across the world. Um, one of my favorites is Meshesh up here. Meshesh, what is this area up here? Russia. That's Russia. Guess what Moscow was called before they named it Moscow? Meshesh. Meshesh. 
knowing the first person to get there. This is secular records verifying the biblical accounts. And that is Ezekiel 38, and that cash was mentioned. Yep. And she cash. The Bible has been found in error in respect to historical finds. Pro Professor Nelson Luke, a world-renowned scholar, stated, I have excavated for 30 years with a Bible on one hand, a trowel on the other, and in matters of historical perspective, I have never found the Bible to be an error. But is that what you hear in, in secular culture? No. No, you hear it's passe, it's been disproved. Geology supports the Bible. When Mount St. Helens blew in about the early 80s, 1980, uh, we got a laboratory example of how you could catastrophically change an environment. How you could create a canyon from the end in one day. How you could get layered sediments in less than a week in a very short period of time. Yeah. The Grand Canyon, which as I was talking about with Russell Miller now, is a laboratory of showing how all these sediments were laid down by the flood, and then when they were still soft, they were cut by waters left over after the flood in a very short period of time. Well, Most of geology is an exceptional example of the biblical account and not what the modernists want. What about the lake drainage? Uh, and I, if I had the time, I'd go into that. If I was just doing, if I was just doing a, a uh, arc account, but you deny the lake drainage business. That what about? Okay, what are you talking about? The lake drainage business? The giant lake that covered the four, the four corners. Of yes, the there probably was. Oh, okay. There were remnant waters, and that's what I said. Oh, yeah. There were remnant waters after the flood. Okay. All of the, all of what we see we was later in agreement. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Historical. Do geology and history support the Bible? We have ample evidence that the Bible's historical accounts are verified in archaeology, geology, and the light of other historical writings. So we can check our second box. And again, there's much more on this in the Bible, including a discussion of yeah. the lakes. What about God writing history in advance? Again, that's called what? Prophecy. There's about 366 predictions of Christ in the Bible. The first one is Genesis 3.15, what they call the Proto-Evangelium. Yeah, but there's a lot of others. Zechariah 12.10 talks about David and his side being pierced. Zechariah 9.9, he'll come in on a donkey. Psalm 16 69, he'll be given gall and vinegar. Psalms 34.20, they won't break his bones. Isaiah 7, you'll be born of a virgin. There are tons of predictions of Christ that only he fit. Some of these he could have faked. I could arrange it to ride in on a donkey. Being born of a virgin and rising on the third day would have been tough. <laughs> okay? There are certain things that he did that you well, simply could not do. Having your guards gamble for your clothing, that's kind of hard to arrange. Oh, it's tough. No, that's normal. And you're, you're hanging up there. Now, you could have said, well, this is to be predictable because of knowing what the, what the Roman guards were. But again, getting all 366 right. Yeah. Just getting 12 of these right is mathematically impossible. There were more than 30 prophecies fulfilled in 1948 when Israel was formed by partition after World War II. Here's a look for that. Yeah. There are about 2,500 prophecies in the Bible. About 2,000 have been fulfilled without error. And that some 3, 000, that, that's over some 3,000 years ago. Some are right in antiquity. But there have been 50 that have been fulfilled just in the last 200 years. Most of those dealing with Israel. Trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the end. The Bible proposed that any prophet would be tested and found errorless. We applied the same test to the Bible when we're going through the book. Amen. Specificity if from God. Now let's let's talk about the type of soothsayers that we see today. Gene Dixon was famous in the 60s. Why? Because he made fuzzy prophecies. Well, she predicted there would be a president killed in the 50s. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but what happens every 30 years? Somebody takes a shot at a president. Reagan got, got hit. 
Yes, he did. Okay. Now she didn't say Kennedy will be assassinated. She said a president will be. And the next and the next decade, she got lucky and she was right and she got all sorts of stuff for that. The Bible is more specific than that. Take a look at Psalms 22. Despised by the people, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. They say, let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him. My bones are out of joint. My mouth is dried up. They pierce my hands and my feet. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. What's this describing? It's describing the crucifixion. The only problem is, this is written, written in Psalms almost 900 years before he's crucified. And it's before they invented What's really weird, thank you. It was written 300 years before the inversions invented crucifixion. That's right. They're even talking about a method of execution that won't come yet. And they're talking with specificity. This is what the Bible does. It shows incredibly specific things, and then they're 100% proved. Amos 9 and Jeremiah 31. Though they go into captivity before their enemies, then I will command the sword. I will sift the house of Israel among all nations that day, and I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen. When they brought Israel back in 1948, where did the Jews come from? Everyone across the world. Israel has actually been re put back together three different times. But the last time was from everywhere. And that's what this is talking about. I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. They shall no more be pulled up out of the land, which I have given them, said the, the Lord thy God. Number one, that tells me where I underline. Is Israel going to be defeated or taken out again before the end? No. no. Won't happen. There will be but what's some, really interesting is they're surrounded. It will be surrounded. Oh, they're, they will live on the worst block in the world. Yeah. But what really is interesting to me here is, is when they came back, they came back into what even what wasn't even normal Israel. They were given a piece of the sea. Yep. And when they did, they're in what area? The Negev Desert. And yet it says, wait a minute, they're going to plant vineyards exactly. and drink wine and make gardens. They did that. If you look at Israel today from space, you see a green spot in the middle of the Negev Desert. They have used so much uh, salt water that they've converted to drinking water and so much underground water that they have lowered the ambient temperature in Israel by three degrees. They have made it a garden again, which was predicted here. Israel will be reformed. That's all talked about in all of this. Ooh, real interesting one. Zephaniah 3.9. For then I will turn to a people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with consent. Now Hebrew was a dead language for 1,800 years. For basically from the time of about 200 A.D. until the Reformation in 1948. During that time, nobody spoke or read in Hebrew except for some scholars. Yes. But suddenly now, we have a nation in which they are speaking Hebrew again. I got a question. How many other nations have had a dead language which went away for even a thousand years and then came back a thousand years later? No. It's, a, it's a round number. This is a God thing. And it was predicted in Scripture, and it has occurred. The Scripture side, we actually make reference to more than 400 incidents where God foretold of historical events before they happened. In the book, I cite 420. Don't, don't run away. I only go in depth into 25 of them. There are only a sampling of what's in the Bible. Was this book written by Nostradamus or God himself? God it was God himself because Nostradamus isn't that good. If you've ever read his quatrains, until they happen, you can't even figure out what he's talking about. Yeah, they're very fuzzy. They're very fuzzy. They're very fuzzy. Does, God, does the whole book hang together with a single theme and evidence of a single writer? Oh, yes. 66 books written by 40 authors over more than 1,500 years. 39 books in the Old Testament tell of God, His creation, our place, and His law. 4,000 plus years 
to demonstrate to ourselves we cannot keep His commandments. Originally in the garden, we were given what? One. One commandment. Couldn't handle it. Then He gave us ten and a few thousand years to show ourselves what? You can't do it by yourself. But the good news was from the very creation, He had an answer. He knew we couldn't get back to Him. And that answer was what? Jesus. Jesus Christ, who is predicted 366 times in the Old Testament, and the whole New Testament is about who? Christ. 27 books in the New Testament show us he knew that, and he had a plan to bridge the gap between a holy God and man from the creation. There's some things in the Old Testament some people don't know is there. Example, Isaiah 40, 11 can only be talking about Christ, just like that Psalms piece I showed you earlier. Ezekiel 18.4 talks about sin and death. Wages is the, is, the, is the death is the wages of sin. Wait a minute. Where have I heard that before? It's in the New Testament. It's in Romans. Yeah. 323. Yes, I like to bring up that Isaiah 40, uh, the chapter before that is 39, which equals the Old Testament. And in the last 27 when I'm starting at 40, this is 66 books of the book of Isaiah, which is a, a sort of a, a, a capsule saying 66 books, no more. Yep. No more Mark 10, 5 and 6, Christ believed in the creation. If you're saying the six days of creation didn't occur the way the Bible says, you're, talk, you're calling Jesus Christ a liar. Amen. That's what they're doing. Luke 17, 27, Christ believed in Noah. Yes. He believed in the building of the big boat. He didn't think it was just a story. He thought it was the truth. They were both carpenters. It all hangs together. Old and New Testament both have the golden rule. New Testament confirms the Genesis account. Passover becomes the Lord's Supper. Both talk of a worldwide flood. New Testament believes in the Old Testament prophets. There's the Trinity in both. You may not have thought of that. Genesis 1-2. What does it tell us? And the earth was formless and void. And the what? Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. What spirit are they talking about? Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God, except that God they used there in that sentence was Elohim. What is Elohim? Plural. Plural. In the beginning, gods. But wait a minute. The whole Bible is consistent on the fact there's only one God. So why would they use the plural there? Yep. When, when, uh, Father, Son, when God came to, to visit Abraham before he went to judge uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, first there's three, then there's one, then there's three, then there's two. I mean, it, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Three, three, one, three, three. It goes on and on. Because it's a trending. It's a different existence than we understand. Exactly. And that's what it's talking about. And that's not the only place. In Genesis 1 1, it's not the only place where a plural God is used in a singular form in a sentence, showing us that the Trinity was also an Old Testament. And there are more things. Confession, saved by faith. How was Abraham saved? By faith. By faith. Well, guess what the New Testament tells you you're saved by? Faith. faith. Consistent. The Dead Sea Scrolls are the oldest intact scriptures. They're about 2,000 years old, and it shows God's words preserved. Again, this book all hangs together as if there was one mind writing. It even has an opening chapter that tells you how things began and a closing chapter, we call it Revelation, that tells you how the whole thing wraps up. Mm -hmm. It is a complete book with one mind writing. And it tells you not to modify it. Not to add to it. In fact, there's bad penalties yeah. if you add to it or take away from it. Exactly. Okay, what about protecting his word? In the first two centuries after Christ, both the Jews and Romans tried to eradicate members of the way. If you don't know, the way was what the Christians were called during the first century. Amen. And they tried to get rid of you, and they tried to get rid of their writings. Both survived and thrived. Voltaire, around 1750 AD, said, In 60 years there should be no Bible. That was 260 years ago. And the Bible is still the most sold and printed book in the world as it has been for centuries. God has a sense of humor. One of my favorite stories is the fact that about 50 years after Voltaire died, his house was sold to a Bible institute that printed, guess what? Bible. Bibles out of his house. God has a sense of humor. I like that. Human word of 
your mouth. Uh, Jim, I did this experiment 30 years ago in the seminar. I had 30 people in the room and I whispered to them that two phrases. Jim went to the aquarium and saw many fish and took pictures of some of them. And then the guy whispered it to, whispered it that one, that one all the way around the room to 30 people. And did it come out the same? No. <laughs> no. That's what you went to the first thing, that though all those other 300 and something testimonies are that situation. They changed. Here's what came out that night. He went to the coast and caught many of the biggest fish in history. He has the pictures to prove him. Some of the fish are now SeaWorld. <laughs> <laughs> Do we lose a lot in translation by word of mouth? And that was the same night. Without God. That was in 15 minutes the same night. What happens over centuries and with thousands of miles of distance? We lose things. The Jews had very good methods of, of making the words have numbers and counting them and keeping track so that they would not make those that, that, the, that The Masorettes and, and others were very big on this. However, we're still not that good. It didn't happen. God's unmistakable friend put fingerprint on history and his work. Because remember, I'm not just talking about protecting this from the time of the Old Testament prophets. I'm telling you this account was known from when? We got off the boat. Amen. And how was it protected during all that period of time? The Dead Sea Scrolls from the 40s and, in the 1940s and 50s, that's when they were found, are the oldest intact scriptures. God's Word, when we compare our current translations to those found about 100 AD, from 100 AD are 99.99% accurate. Again, man's not that good. As noted, archaeological finds and historical records verify the accuracy of the Bible. The Bible stands alone as the best preserved literary works of all antiquity. We have thousands of existing Old Testament manuscripts throughout the Middle East, Mediterranean, and European regions, and they agree phenomenally with each other. But when they were spread out like that, how is it they agree so well? Again, uh, it's, it's a God thing. The manuscript evidence for the New Testament is also dramatic with nearly 25,000 ancient man manuscripts discovered in archives so far. Today's translations, as I, as I was noting before we started tonight, the King James has problems, like Holy Ghost I don't think is quite right. It should be Holy Spirit. But from all of these manuscripts, can we tell pretty well what the original manuscript said? Oh, yes. We can. We can piece it together. Now, there are other writings like Julius Caesar's Gaelic Wars, Pliny's Younger's Natural History, Herodotus' History. How many of those copies do we have? Ten, seven, eight. Are people questioning whether those are anywhere close to the original? No, they don't. No, they only take pot shots at the Bible that we have tens of thousands of manuscripts of and can verify. <laughs> Plato is another example. Renowned Bible scholar F.F. F. Bruce declares there is no body of ancient literature in the world which enjoys such a wealth of good textual attestation as the New Testament. Just one more piece from, Gen from uh, China. Genesis 2 7, God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And to create, they used the radicals for breath, dust, walking, and alive. Again, when you see this, created, created in the Chinese language approximately 2500 BC, you're seeing that they understood the Genesis account. Clearly. In spite of whole nations who would eradicate the Jews and Christians in their writings, they have proliferated, proliferated throughout history. In spite of human and te technological limitations, the Bible shows inerrant accuracy to an unbelievably miraculous extent. Remember how bad our mouth, word of mouth is. This is God's unmistakable footprint on history and His work. Fingerprint. His fingerprints. And the final thing we get into is pre-science. If we pass this test, this is six things out of six. If you're a mathematician, we are down to a 1.6% chance of, of all of these things coming to be fruition, of coming to be proved. You can't apply probability to stuff like this. Well, I did. You can. Writing in the Bible, which reveals an understanding of science far in advance of scientific breakthroughs. 
Moses wrote in Numbers 19, any person touching a carcass must be washed. Well, that's just common sense. They knew that because that made common sense. Let me tell you a story, and this is what I do in the book a lot. I'll tell you a story after that. The story before that was of Dr. Semmelweis, which I've left out. The story after this is of what happened with the Black Plague. About, about let's see, about 2,500 years after this. What do they do during the Black Plague when somebody gets sick? They keep them in the house with all the other family members and nurse them. So what happens? They all get sick. They all get sick. Cool. But anyone touching a person must be washed. And in fact, there are, others, there are other scriptures that tell us if somebody's sick or they are unclean, what do you do with them? You quarantine them. Yes. You keep them away from everyone. They didn't pay attention to that and they paid for it. Any open vessel jar must be considered unclean. Excellent growth medium. We said, well, that's common sense. You leave a jar of mayonnaise open too long, you better not go eat from it. They didn't understand that at that point. Don't eat rodents, hares. They harbor bubonic plague, rabies, some of the worst diseases known. Reptiles live in stagnant waters, growth medium. Cats feed on rodents. Well, there's a mouse in it. That's the wrong kind of mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Dogs, rabies, and other diseases which we now immunize against them. Further mosaic laws about transferring diseases from animal to animal. This is all in Moses' writing. How did he know all this? I read it. That's why bestiality was... Leviticus 11. Hebrews allowed the cattle family, sheep, goats, deer, fowl, and fish with scales and fins. Unclean things in water without scales and fins, cats, dogs, birds of prey, reptiles, hares, swine. Let's talk about swine for a minute. We eat, I eat pig today. In fact, I had, I had ribs today. I had sausage. Today, we cure our meat to where it doesn't have things in it. For example, in, in swine, there was trichinosis worms, a type of tapeworm. Now, trichinosis has a incubation period of between 10 and 45 days. Do you eat bad pig meat because you didn't cook it well? And then... A month later, you get sick and you say, oh yeah, I ate pig a month ago. Do we make that association? No. Especially when another time you cook pork, but you cooked it well and therefore you didn't get sick. That association is almost impossible to make it. How did the Bible make it? Leviticus 11, unclean, crawling sea animals found in the mouths of shallow streams. If you're a clam and you're sitting at the mouth of a stream, at this time, 3,000 years ago, what were they doing in rivers? Dumping sewage. Bathing in rivers, dumping sewage in rivers, defecating in rivers, cleaning their clothes in rivers, cleaning their uten utensils in rivers. So if you are a clam, you are taking in oh, raw sewage. Yes. And so the Bible brightly tells you, don't eat it. What was done in rivers? We just talked about that, and then they were talking and taking in raw sewage. How did Moses know all this? Was it common sense? No. no. Uh, it wasn't common sense for the people with the bubonic plague. It was, common sense is not all that common. Not trichinosis, we pointed that out. How could they have figured that out? Not bacterial transmission. Uh, that's a story I tell with Dr. Semmelweis of how even in the 19th century they, didn't, they couldn't figure that one out. Excuse me, the 18th century. They didn't want to. They didn't want to. How did Moses know? Well, he, wait a minute. He was brought up an Egyptian. Maybe the Egyptians had this advanced medical knowledge. <laughs> He's loud. Let, let's check out what, how, what Egyptian medical knowledge was at the time. The highest culture of the time. They treated cuts with manure. Yeah. Now, incidentally, if you get the chance to treat a cut, don't use manure. Why? It's a great way to get an infection, not keep an infection away. Yeah, I, th I think it was, was it the, uh, the, the North Vietnamese, the communists, uh, they would set up ambushes, they'd put manure on the spikes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh that was wicked. They, they would bleed with leeches. Incidentally, this is a practice that will, that will continue up to the 19th century all over the world. So are we finding this higher medical knowledge in Egypt? No, we're not. For Moses, such knowledge not possible till the late 19th century. 
Moses would have had to have had modern degrees in food chain, microbiology, disease theory, and bacterial immunology. Or he had help from the manufacturer. He had help from the creator, which is what we see in the Bible. This is the 12-step process for blood coagulation. It is an amazing process that allows when you have a cut for the blood to coagulate at that spot, but what do we not want it to do? Coagulate all the way through your body, but we want it to coagulate fairly quickly. And so we have this amazing process. The Bible tells us in Genesis 17, 12, it directed the Jews to circumcise male babies on the eighth day. The liver starts using vitamin K to produce prothombrin, one of those 12-step uh, directed chemicals between the fifth and seventh day. The peak production of prothombrin is on the eighth day of life. Circumcision for a male is both hygienic and healthful. How did they know the eighth day? We only figured this out in the last three years. Pre-science, the laws of thermodynamics. The first law of matter is matter is neither created nor destroyed by normal chemical means. This is common sense. Do things just pop into existence? No. And do they just pop out of existence? Only when God has created them. Yes. <clears throat> Psalms 148, 2 Peter 3. These are just two examples, Ecclesiastes 1, 9, and 10, of the Bible understanding this law deeply. The first law of thermodynamics, things don't just pop in and out of existence. Second law of thermodynamics, everything is wearing out, entropy, becoming more disordered. Genesis 3, Romans 8, Psalms 102, everything is growing old like a garment, unless God decides to do something different. The miracle of the Israelis during the 40 years of the wilderness. What do you remember about their clothes? Their shoes didn't dry out. Their shoes did not wear out and their clothes didn't wear out. But Are you still wearing the same clothes you wore 40 years ago? They actually grew to fit their bodies. They actually grew to fit their bodies. That's an amazing. Again, that's a God thing. But the rest of the Bible talks about a deep understanding of the corruption, of the curse, of everything wearing out. Yeah, at least it got mad at me because I wanted to interrupt their drying cycle to clean the lint off the filter. You know, because, you know, whenever, uh, you know, she does clothes on the weekends, the lint really builds up on that lint filter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is my son's room when company's coming. You can tell company's coming because he's made the bed. This is my son's room on a normal day. This is definite evidence of entropy. Everything goes to disorder. We work with this kind of law all the time, and the Bible understood it well. But evolution says, one first law, things don't just pop into existence. What does the Big Bang say? Uh -huh. Suddenly everything popped into existence. Space. And then, and, natural and then, when everything is developing up, getting more organized, going from single cell to multi cell to animals to man, it's developing upwards. But what does the second law tell us? Everything is, should be evolving what? Yeah. Downward. These are two, these are two things that, that evolution violates. The Bible understands it. Ecclesiastes 1 7, the water cycle, all streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. But the place where the streams come from, there they return again. That's a beautiful restatement. I, I taught science for a period of time, and this would have been a nice definition I could have put into a kid's book for the what? The water cycle. For hydrology. Myelitis in the 6th century thought it was all subterranean. Aristotle thought it all came from underground springs. Da Vinci thought it the mountains even. They had water coming up underground, even up to the top of the mountains. Galileo, it just gave him a headache. Because he couldn't figure out where all the water came from. It wasn't until Pierre Perrault Seine examined the same river valley in 1674 that he actually figured out there's enough rainwater coming down here to go into the rivers and to go into the sea. And that and it wasn't until this time that they figured it out. But the Bible figured this out 2,000 to 2,500 years earlier. Well, the, the subterranean business is, is, is connected with the flood. Hey, because before the flood, there was subterranean water coming up. 
And that was what was yes. written around. Yes. Not the Bible figured out. The Bible explained it. The Bible explained it. You are quite true. It was God who knew it. Didn't figure it out. God knew it. And is the one scripture in Ecclesiastes the only one that describes this hydrology cycle? No, no. no. They go on and on and on and on showing the manufacture of God's wisdom. Isaiah 40, 22, the circle of the earth. Or the round of the earth. Now, you could have figured this one out if you understood eclipses and you understood some type of of celestial mechanics. Maybe they figured that one out, maybe they didn't. But I'll tell you one they couldn't figure out. Job 26 7, the earth, earth hangs in space. Have they been up there and checked that one out yet? Nope. No. No. At the time that this was written by Job, the oldest book in the Bible, written somewhere between 1800 and 1900 at BC. The Hindus believed that the, whole, the earth was riding on the back of a celestial turtle. The Greeks thought that Atlas was holding up the world. The Chinese and most of the world believed it was flat. And if you went too far, you fell, off. you fell off. But the Bible had this one right. This is pre-science. 1 Corinthians 15, 41, each star is different. There are main sequence stars. Our, our sun is a what? G2, main sequence yellow dwarf. But of all the other yellow dwarfs that we found, it is most the most stable. The most stable. It was made for us. We have not found one star that's exactly like another. We are getting verification of this scripture all the time. <laughs> Hebrews 11.3, creation made of invisible elements. At that time, did they know that there were atoms and neutrons and electrons? No, but that was talked about in scripture. They argued about whether space was empty or filled with fluid. Job 38, 19 through 20, light moves. They thought light was just automatically existent. And yet we now know that it does move as the Bible talked about. Jeremiah 32, stars are uncountable. At the time of this writing in Jeremiah, which was approximately 600 BC, they believed they knew how many stars were in each hemisphere. They could count just about 3,000 in each hemisphere. And yet the stars are uncountable. What happens every time we get a new telescope? More. We find more. They will. We find more. Biogenesis. According to the Bible, everything reproduces according to its kind. Now, incidentally, folks, this is the most verified experiment in the history of humanity. Amen. Every time a chicken plucks out an egg, what comes out of the egg? Yeah. A chick, not an elephant. Every time an elephant plops out a baby, we don't get a lizard. Everything produces according to its kind. This is what the Bible says, but that's not what evolution says. And according to the Bible, life always comes from life. It will take Louis Pasteur to establish that for us in the very recent past. Abiogenesis is the dependence for evolution. It says at some point, life came from lifeless material. Science is supposed to be about what we can test, repeat, and observe. Have we ever seen lifeless material become alive? Nope. Has never been observed. Not even Miller case. Well, five o'clock and a lot of government offices. <laughs> <laughs> the dead become alive, especially Friday at five. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get in the way. Now again, for brevity tonight, I cut out a lot of stories, Semmelweis, uh, Matthew Morey, they're all in the book. But does anybody know how George Washington died? Blood 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 blood. Blood. Yeah, let's take, a look. let's take a look at this. Thursday, December 12, he was exposed to snow and 30 degree weather. Friday, he developed a tracheal and upper respiratory infection. He got sick. Now, but, Washington was a believer in bloodletting. Where did we talk about bloodletting before? This came back, Romans. clear back to the ancient Egyptians. Yeah. He got a neighborhood bloodletter to come over. This wasn't a doctor, just a neighbor, who came over and took 12 to 14 ounces of blood out. Incidentally, Martha was protesting the whole time. His wife did not believe in this, but he went ahead and had the 12 to 14 ounces taken out. 
Saturday, Dr. Rod at 11 a.m. He wasn't feeling better. In fact, he was feeling worse, so he do, drew another basin of blood. What they were thinking was, you're taking out the poison. Right. What they called bad humors. Right. No better, the doctor drew another basin of blood in the early afternoon and 32 ounces at 4 p.m. What's happening? Oh, <laughs> He's literally being bled to death. Yeah. He deteriorated further and died at 11 p.m. The Bible, Washington was literally bled to death, but if you paid attention to Leviticus 17.11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. If you paid attention to the Bible, to God, or to his wife, and I'm not going to touch any of that, <laughs> he might have lived a little longer. Yeah, it would be good to pay attention to his wife. Yep. The first woman in Genesis 3.20 we read, Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. We actually have mitochondrial DNA evidence that says all human, all races, came from the same primordial woman called Eve. Not from several races nor several Eves, from one original woman. You don't hear about the Eve syndrome talked about in secular literature much today. And here's why. And here's why. Measured rate of variation, mutation, and degradation showed in 1998 that the original Eve was between 6,000 and 8,000 years ago. You ain't hearing about that on CNN. Because what is that consistent with? The, 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 the biblical account. And incidentally, this morph picture of 20-year-old women from all across the world, that's a morph of 1 million women. What are her, what's distinctive about her? She's, a, she's an average between all races. She's got some color to her, but she's not white, she's not black. She's got some mongoloid in her, but she's also got Caucasian, Negroid, etc. Incidentally, that is probably not a picture of what Eve looked like. If it's a picture of anyone, it's a picture of when did we start over? The flood. The flood. It may have been what Noah's wife looked like. But probably not that either, because within 10 generations after an offspring goes out, their uh, genetics are so differentiated that there's not a whole lot of traits left. But again, evolutionists won't even talk about Eve because this is, as far as they're talking about, this is bad stuff. 20 studies show that if a person attends church on an even semi-regular basis, once a month or more, they will live longer and healthier lives. We got multiple scriptures that tell you that. This is all in the book. Confess your faults to one another, pray for one another, and they may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's out of James. Does prayer work? Yes. How many studies have been done testing a statistical link between prayer and lowering blood pressure and metabolic rate? Just love that connection. How many studies? You're going to miss it. 1,200. With 80% of them showing a linkage. How many studies have been done on prayer and healing, what they call remote healing? There have been 191. Two-thirds of them showed a statistical link. 76% of them were excellent studies. Let me give you one example of that. 1999 at St. Luke's Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri by Dr. William Harris. Well, Harris was an agnostic. He had seen an earlier study, which I described in the book, which made him put the study together. There were a thousand patients studied with strong prayer controls. When I say strong prayer controls, when you have a scientific study, you always have a treated group and a control group. The treated group got prayer. He made sure that not only was that control group not being prayed for by his people, they weren't being prayed for by anybody else. He gave it a questionnaire to find out if anybody would pray for them. Strong prayer controls. The prayer patients did 11% better. Dr. Williams, when you get an 11% um, result from a medical study, is that significant? It's, it's usually fairly significant. If they get 50%, they have steak dinner and a party. Yeah. Is there pre-science in the Bible? We have shown you about 40 examples of science knowledge described in the Bible far ahead of what had been known for the time. There's more than 100 in my book. Who gave the Bible such writers such modern scientific insights? My friend, Jesus, the Messiah. This is a God thing. What have we seen? 
The Bible contains the original creation stories and its elements are copied in other cultures, and we showed multiple examples of that. Geology and history support the Bible, and we showed multiple examples of that. The Bible has revealed history in advance on thousands of occasions, and we showed multiple examples of that, 400 of them to be exact. He has protected his word for more than 4,000 years in a magical way. And we have multiple examples of that. Logical cohesion. The Bible hangs together with one theme and one writer. Who is the one theme of the whole Bible? Jesus. Jesus Christ. And the Bible is full of pre-science showing the Creator's knowledge of science thousands of years before us. The logical conclusion is that there is a God in the whole, and, the, and He wrote the Bible. The question is whether we will believe the evidence and let it bolster our faith or walk away from our Creator. <laughs> Folks, I just gave you a piece of what I got in the book. Um, I hope that we can get this type of presentation out to youth and to, and to other churches because I not only believe it will support people's belief, but it also will talk to the unbeliever about this is not just junk. This is real. Your thoughts and questions. Well, <clears throat> something you could have included, um, and it may be in your book, I need to make sure I can to read through your book. And we've talked about this before, we may have even had it on our program. Um, but in um, the book of Deuteronomy, it talks about how when you're in a camp, you need to go outside a camp. It's in the book. And, okay, it's in the book. It's in the book. Now, as I said, there's tons of stuff in the book. One of the things that uh, my, my thing started to run away from me. But, but one of the things I like about that is that the, the, at the Battle of El Alamein, the British actually applied that. that you know, they had uh, very uh, stringent pooping procedures. And the Germans would just poop any place. And, and, the and they got sick. Yeah. It, it, was a, it was a problem. If you pay attention to the Bible, good things happen. One of the things Dr. Williams constantly uh, uh, chided and or advised me about was that this thing does not need to become way too long. And it was longer than, <laughs> than, than, than he would have advised. Couldn't include everything. Uh, so I couldn't include everything. For example, there are two chapters I simply threw out. I threw out one chapter in which I was going to give you more creation stories. Well, that would be nice, but I've already made the point. Amen. And it would be, it would, it would be I would, creation stories. I investigated over 300 creation accounts from across the world. I gave you 29 examples of the book. I could have given you another 32, which I had in the supplemental chapter, but so the book wouldn't go over 500 pages, I kicked that out. Another chapter I cut out, I did a full year's research on, well, what about all of these claims that the Bible is full of errors? Let's answer them all. <laughs> After a year's research, I found out to answer them all, number one, I would spend the rest of my life, and number two, this would become the Encyclopedia Britannica. That's a new book. Yeah. <laughs> I, I ain't going there because I spent a year on it, and I, it made me punt. There are about eight examples in there of where translational issues and others can answer just about anything that people bring up. But I, but I did try to make it readable. Anything else you want to talk about in this presentation or in this work? Yes, sir. I'd like to comment that years ago, back in the middle 90s, I uh, sent for a uh, information on what's called Bible code. You heard of it? Okay. Yep. I found it interesting that in a little excerpt of a newspaper, Jewish newspaper in San Diego, I mean, yeah, San Diego, they said that in the Bible code, uh, what they call equal space distancing, you know, in the Bible from Genesis, they were able to get the name Torah, T O R A H. We're able to get every 50 letters in the in the Bible. You get T O 50 A. You know, and all of that, all the way through the Bible, indicating God's imprimatur. You know. I yeah. I don't talk about the Bible code. I'm very aware of the Bible code. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't talk about it in the, in the book. Uh, Missler uh, has Chuck Missler has really pushed that. 
The original uh, work by that was done by a guy named Paven. And I do mention Paven in my book because at one point he was a cryptographer for uh, our side in World War II. And one of the interesting things he does show that I believe in, I'm not too sure about the Bible code stuff, so I'm not going to touch that. All right. But in terms of what he does show is they had a methodology for checking a message when it came to them to see whether it was played with or not. Whether somebody had intercepted it and changed the wording in some way or whether it came from the original sender. And when you apply that cryptography to the Bible, it shows that, it's, that we are getting it from the original sender. That it has not been changed over time to a great extent. Anything else? All right. We have multiple copies, not only of my book, but other materials back there. The paid stuff is on the left side. The free stuff is on the right side. Um, if you're not getting our newsletter, the sign-up sheet is back there as normal. Any final prayer requests? I thank you all for your attention. I was not probably as bad as Ken Ham. I did an interview with Ken Ham one time. Ham, Ham usually speaks at about 80 words per minute, but he has gusts up to 120. <laughs> because he's so excited about his stuff. Okay? And I get excited about this material as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you for writing the book. Thank you. Let, let's pray. Lord God, thank you for these people tonight. Let, let this be a tool to be used, and I pray that it's a tool that you, that you have guided your hand in. Thank you for them and protect them as they go home. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.